The social responsibility of the company was the theme of Pope Benedict XVI's speech to officials from Achea. The Pope said that the production of goods and services should not only be tied to the pursuit of economic profit, but also to the promotion of the common good. Oracle's cash grants to hundreds of community-based organizations make a difference at the local level. One of the ways that the ING Foundation achieves its goals is through key relationships with nonprofits. This is part of a worldwide uh, organization of crisis responders. It is a massive organization. I'm think really about. excited about what Aramark is doing for me and my community. I love giving back to my community. I gave a little bit. I As corporate citizens, what can we do to make an impact? As our readings for this week make clear, this question of corporate citizenship and the duties it entails is a growing priority for many companies, especially large ones with considerable visibility, as is the case with the corporation we read about in Keith Epstein's piece in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. That corporation is Raytheon. Raytheon really is a good place to start when talking about this matter of corporate social responsibility, or CSR. Here we have a major American defense contractor with huge revenues, tens of thousands of employees, and relatively sophisticated CSR initiatives, one of which is the project highlighted in Epstein's piece. That is, Raytheon's efforts to boost interest in education in science and math among youngsters in Tucson, which is where the company's missile system subsidiary is based. The rationale for this is pretty obvious. As Raytheon Community Relations Manager Diane Bissell is quoted as saying in Epstein's article, we have engineers and scientists and we need engineers and scientists. Why would we fund a program for nurses' aides? This is the kind of strategic giving that, according to our readings, is becoming increasingly popular in the corporate world. It's the kind of giving in which a corporation identifies interests of its own that overlap with the interests of society. In the case of Raytheon, Tucson schools benefit from the funding and volunteer support, and as already explained, Raytheon benefits by cultivating a strong future workforce. But there are other components to Raytheon's corporate citizenship. Its website details several of its environment-friendly business practices and sustainability projects. And a press release in the Investor Relations section describes the company's involvement with the Special Olympics. How are we to understand these initiatives that seemingly don't relate to Raytheon's bottom line? Vic Murray, the author of our second required reading, puts forth this bifurcated paradigm consisting of the social responsibility rationale and the good for business rationale. These are two proposed ways of conceiving of corporate citizenship. At first glance, our inclination might be to categorize Raytheon's educational initiatives in the Tucson area as emanating from the good for business rationale, while categorizing Raytheon's environmental initiatives as being products of the social responsibility rationale, because they appear more or less unrelated to Raytheon's business interests. But we encounter a problem here, as demonstrated by Murray. After he writes about the belief that companies should fulfill their responsibilities as good corporate citizens, he goes on to write, They are convinced that a prosperous, healthy, well-educated, culturally alive community is in the long run good for all businesses and that it provides high-caliber employees and knowledgeable consumers. So now we see that there still is self-interest involved, however enlightened that self-interest might be. And we see this caveat again and again. Murray goes on to write that another reason for CSR is the belief that it is in the long run in the interest of business for governments not to pay for and thereby control the services provided by nonprofits. Murray later cites studies indicating that corporate executives do believe in corporate giving, but the notion is always followed by the acknowledgement that giving is good for enhancing the public image or attracting a high quality workforce. Oh, that, that is one of the reasons why you attract the best talent. Because you're more than just a carbon black company. You're more than just an aluminium rolling or a textile company. You are a socially transforming, uh, responsible, caring, committed, passionate organization. Murray acknowledges that the line between social responsibility and business-related values can be a thin one. He illustrates this idea by mentioning a marketing strategy he once heard from a highly regarded PR executive who told him that in order to improve their public image, companies should try to appear as purely philanthropic as possible, and that requires giving to charities that are not too closely aligned or aligned at all with clear business interests. Companies should also not advertise the giving too much. They should instead rely on the charities themselves to do the name dropping. That's the hospital we are working with in Delhi, the Shroff Charity Eye Hospital. It has a very well-equipped pediatric ophthalmic center, which was made possible in part by a gift from the Ronald McDonald Charity. 
So eating burgers actually helps. <laughs> As Murray writes, the trick is to encourage recognition without seeming to ask for it by placing the donations where key stakeholders will easily hear about them. Now, Murray classifies this strategy as adhering to the good for business framework, but now we have to ask ourselves, when corporations are recruiting this kind of advice from top level PR consultants, how can we even be sure anymore? Without really interrogating the intentions of individual executives, how can we know the motive behind this or that social responsibility initiative if it's entirely possible that the strategy is to make us think that these projects are the result of a concern for social welfare? So again, does this description of the social responsibility rationale fit the moniker, especially if the alternative in this two-part system is the so-called good for business rationale? The description Murray offers of the social responsibility rationale suggests that this supposed responsibility is in fact good for business. And of course, these two don't need to be mutually exclusive. So what excites me about green, it's a combination of green for the environment and, and green for like money. I just think it's a perfect combination. But the fact that Murray assigns one of them to a certain case study and then proceeds in the reading to categorize companies according to how bottom line oriented or social responsibility oriented they are, this indicates that the intention here is to classify certain business practices as either chiefly donations or investments. Dennis Young and Dwight Burlingame, the authors of our second recommended reading, offer what appears to be a slightly more sophisticated framework for understanding CSR. They give us four models. The first is the neoclassical corporate productivity model, which holds that corporations exist to make a profit and their CSR initiatives are designed to contribute to that. It's basically Murray's good for business rationale. Well, when I complained that his prices were too high, he could see those profits going right out the window if we didn't buy from him. So naturally he offered to help us out with his truck so he could make a sale and a profit. Number two is the ethical slash altruistic model, which as Young and Burlingame write, is based on an understanding that corporations and the societies they operate within are extremely interdependent. It presumes a certain level of discretion on the part of corporate giving officials and a certain aloofness from the operational pressures of making profits in the marketplace so that, within certain limits, managers can pursue a set of charitable goals not directly related to corporate interests. So this is basically Murray's social responsibility rationale, complete with the ambiguity, since the mentioning here of the interdependence between the corporation and the society within which it operates should again lead us to ask if the clear self-interest involved here can really be regarded as a genuine altruistic concern for social welfare. As for number two, it's interesting that Young and Burlingame mention this idea that workers can be aloof from operational pressures. We'll be returning to this idea later. The third model is the political model. Adopting this concept, we can look at CSR initiatives as stemming from a motivation to preserve corporate power and autonomy by building private initiatives as an alternative to the growth of governmental authority and by limiting government interference in the free enterprise system. They also write that corporations engage in philanthropy in order to legitimize or protect their economic power. And they give the example of tobacco companies that give away a lot of money to prove themselves as good public citizens. This is interesting. On the one hand, it allows us to look at CSR in a more nuanced way. So returning to Raytheon's environmental initiatives, if we look at them through this political lens, then we may be even more tempted to abandon the idea that this is all about social responsibility and instead consider that it might be a reaction to the chastising Raytheon received a few years ago from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency for contaminating the groundwater in Tucson. But on the other hand, we should pay attention to the fact that Young and Burlingame mentioned that corporations do CSR in order to protect their economic power. Indeed, why would a corporation want to limit government interference in the market and manage public perceptions and all that stuff? Because it's good for business. So we can collapse this model back into the first model, neoclassical and corporate productivity. This political model just brings up one facet of corporate productivity. Same thing goes for the fourth model, the stakeholder model, in which we observe that corporate philanthropy and corporate social behavior, broadly speaking, are guided by the desire of corporate leadership to steer a clear path through the shoals of stakeholder interests. Young and Burlingame acknowledge that this is arguably the most comprehensive model, because again, we can collapse it into the neoclassical model, because it's possible to argue that corporations manage stakeholder interests in order to do what they are designed to do make a profit for their shareholders, who are obviously stakeholders. But a stakeholder can also be a Tucson resident who is put in danger by contaminated groundwater. And if Raytheon's leadership is genuinely concerned with that person's welfare, not just as a function of keeping Raytheon viable, but genuinely concerned, then this stakeholder model also incorporates the ethical slash altruistic model. So it really is the most comprehensive. But really, for all intents and purposes, 
What the authors offer is just a slightly more fleshed out version of Murray's breakdown. Good for business, social responsibility, with a question mark next to social responsibility.